So far, we've covered moist heat and dry heat as means of microbial control. Now, let's look at some other physical means of microbial control, like cold and desiccation. All cold really does is essentially slow the growth of cultures and microbes in food during processing and storage. Cold does not kill most microbes. In fact, freezing can actually preserve cultures. Neglecting the fact that freezing does not kill most microbes is probably responsible for numerous cases of food poisoning. Things like Staphylococcus aureus, Clostridium, and Streptococcus species, along with several yeasts, molds, and viruses, can survive for months in the refrigerator. Desiccation is another means we might use. Desiccation is when vegetative cells are dehydrated when they're directly exposed to normal room air. This will eradicate some of the more delicate species, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, within just a few hours of desiccation. However, staphylococci and streptococci in dried secretions can remain viable in the air and dust for really lengthy periods of time. Desiccation can be a great way to preserve foods because it reduces the water content and thus prevents microbial growth. Sometimes we'll use a combination of freezing and drying. This is called lyophilization. This is used to preserve microorganisms and other cells in a viable state for many years. So to summarize, chilling, freezing, and desiccation should not be thought of as methods of disinfection or sterilization. They simply slow microbial growth. Now let's look at some other means of energy like radiation as antimicrobial agents. Radiation exists in many different states, and, but as far as microbial control is concerned, we're only really interested in gamma rays, x-rays, and UV radiation. Radiation is when we have energy emitted from atomic activities and dispersed at high velocity through matter or space. It can either result in actually ejecting electrons, removing them from the source, or just exciting the atoms without removing electrons. When a cell is bombarded with certain waves or particles, its molecules absorb some of the available energy. There's one of two consequences. Ionizing radiation, where the electrons are actually ejected and leave ions behind. This is gamma rays, x-rays, and then high-speed electron flow. These affect microbes by damaging proteins. We used to think that the ionizing radiation caused DNA damage. However, recently we've learned that it's really the proteins that have issues, and so the machinery of the cell is broken, and thus the cell cannot survive. The other option is non-iodizing radiation. That leaves us with ultraviolet radiation. In this case, the atomic excitation causes the formation of abnormal bonds within molecules, such as DNA. This causes mutations in the DNA. We'll look at these in more detail in just a few moments. Now, over recent years, ionizing radiation has become much safer and more economical to use, so its applications have expanded hugely in the recent years. Irradiation is a cold sterilization technique. That is, it requires no heat, so it can be very useful for applications where heat might cause damage. We accomplish the radiation by using gamma ray machines, x-ray machines, or cathode ray machines. The product is irradiated for a short time at a carefully chosen dosage. And radiation penetrates liquids and most solids, with gamma rays being the most penetrating X-rays having intermediate level of penetration, and then cathode rays being the least penetrating. So the dosage of radiation is measured in grays, and exposure from these machines ranges from 5 to 50 kilograys. Kilogray is 1,000 grays. The applications for using ionizing radiation in microbial control are in food products and medical products. Things like flour, pork, ground beef, fruits, and vegetables are sterilized using ionizing radiation. And primarily, it's used to kill the pathogens, worms, insects, and inhibit the sprouting of things like white potatoes. Now here's a question to think about. What does it do to the livingness of fresh foods? For example, if you think about raw foodists, they eat raw foods for the benefit of their livingness, like, for example, their enzymes. 
But some of the side effects of this radiation treatment, like with egg whites, is they'll turn white and milky and really liquefy. And alfalfa seeds don't germinate properly. They say that no radiation is left in the food and that it's safe. However, I personally have some reservations about that. The main advantages are the speed, the penetration power, and that no heat is required. When we look at non-ionizing radiation, we're considering ultraviolet rays. The wavelengths are of approximately 100 to 400 nanometers, with 240 to 280 being the most lethal doses. Ultraviolet radiation is not nearly as penetrating as ionizing radiation because it has a lower energy state. The most common tool we'll see in non-ionizing radiation treatments is the germicidal lamp, and it runs at about 254 nanometer wavelengths of light. These are really powerful tools for destroying fungal cells and spores, bacterial vegetative cells, protozoa, and viruses. However, they have pretty poor penetrating power. The way they work is by forming pyrimidine dimers. These are abnormal linkages that are formed between pyrimidines. You'll remember that the pyrimidines are the single ringed nitrogenous bases. So for example, between two thymines, as we see here, this interferes with normal DNA replication and transcription because in the process of replication, the bases that will match up here are not the correct bases like A's. Anyway, these interfere with normal DNA replication and transcription, which of course inhibits growth and causes cell death. Also, non-ionizing radiation like UV rays will generate toxic photochemical products called free radicals. These products inhibit cell processes by binding to the DNA, RNA, and proteins and preventing them from interacting properly. Ultraviolet radiation is usually used in disinfection rather than sterilization, and it's used for things like hospital rooms, operating rooms, schools, or food prep areas and dental offices. It can also be used to treat drinking water or purify liquids. They'll spread a thin liquid film under radiation lamps. This can be used for things like juices, milk, vaccines, or plasma. However, there are some issues with it because the lamps themselves cause sunburn, retinal damage, cancer, and premature wrinkling, all the effects that we know well from the sun. Another means of sterilization could be filtration. This is where we pass a liquid or a gas through a filter with sufficiently small pore size. You can see in the figure over here as the liquid passes through, some microbes are stuck on the other side of the filter. The pores can be anywhere from 8 microns to 0.02 microns. So 8 microns is really fine and that 0.02 is considered ultra fine. These really small pores permit true sterilization because they even prevent the passage of viruses. Also we use these filters to separate microorganisms or enumerate bacteria in water analysis. They can be used to prepare blood products like serum or drugs, IV fluids, different growth media. They can be used to decontaminate milk or beer so that heat's not necessary. HEPA filters are high efficiency particulate air filters. We use them to provide decontaminated airflow in hospital rooms or other sterile rooms. The advantage of filtration is that there's no thermal damages. The disadvantage is, depending on the filter size, that sometimes viruses are not eliminated and it can only be used for liquid or gases. The final means of microbial control that we'll consider is osmotic pressure. This is where we add a large enough amount of salt or sugar to food such that it creates a hypertonic environment for the bacteria. This hypertonic environment causes all the fluids to move out of the bacterial cells and causes plasmolysis. That is, the cell membrane is pulling away from the cell wall. This makes it impossible for cells to multiply. It's used for curing meat and then in high sugar preserves like jellies and jams. So that brings us to the end of a section on physical agents of microbial control. Let's have a quick concept check before we move on to look at chemical agents. Which of these is least likely to result in sterilization? Incineration, baking at 170 degrees C, boiling, or autoclaving? So here we're looking for the least likely. We know that incineration basically vaporizes the cell, forms ash, so we'll take that off the list. We also know that autoclaving is very effective at killing most everything. 
Baking at 170 degrees C, that should take care of it. But boiling only is at 100 degrees C, and it does not kill the spores. So boiling is the correct answer here.